Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. I'm very excited for this morning's hangout. Um, we are back in South Africa. We're joining paleoanthropologist Lee Berger and his expert team in the home stretch of their three week expedition to the Rising Star Cave System in South Africa. A little background, in 2013, during the first expedition to Rising Star, Lee and his team discovered more than a thousand fossil elements belonging to Homo naledi, a previously unknown early human relative. Since then, they've discovered more chambers with more fossils of this new species, and we're really excited to see what's been happening since our last visit. Lee, I know that there's been lots of exciting things going on. How's everybody doing today? Oh, everyone's doing fantastic here, and we'll get a chance to... Uh Go visit everyone in both of the chambers and here at the command center. First, a big hello to Dane Fern College. Uh, you're just 20 minutes down the road from us. Uh, it's hard to believe that uh, we're sitting here in the darkness of a cave and you're out there in the sunlight or the darkness of your auditorium. And also, hello to the schools that are joining us from around the world, particularly those here in South Africa. Um, a little bit of background of what we're doing here. We started this expedition uh, just about two weeks ago. And we had several goals in mind as we were coming back into the rising star cave system where the Homo naledi fossils were discovered in 2013. The first thing that we were trying to do here was to test the idea of whether Homo naledi actually went down what we call the chute. That's a very narrow entryway into the Dinaledi chamber. A lot of people could not believe that Homo naledi went down this very narrow chute. If any one of you have followed this, you'll realize that our scientists today and our explorers have to squeeze down through a passageway that is 12 meters long and it points 18 centimeters wide. The first hominids that we found back in 2013 were found in sort of a second chamber, well away from the chute entrance. And a lot of people argued uh, that there must be another entrance. So if one of the first things we were testing on this expedition was, did Homo naledi come down the chute or was there another entrance? Now we had lots of geologists trying to test this, lots of geologists looking around for other entrances and they could find no evidence either in the uh, soil in the cave or using uh, high-tech equipment of another entrance. Well, I can tell you that the first uh, thing that we've tested here is certainly true. We've actually found uh, parts of the skeletons of Homo naledi at the base of the chute in what we would call a debris cone. That's really a pile of rubble and dirt right down at the, uh, the base of the chute, which uh, gives strong evidence that Homo naledi actually did enter from that direction. Now, we don't know whether the chute was quite as restrictive as it is today, but we do know it was very, very restrictive because we don't really find the other rem uh, rem the remains of other animals associated with Homo naledi in the antechamber and the chamber where we discovered most of the fossils. So that was big news for us. The second thing we were looking for is artifacts because Homo naledi's hands and its, its physiology, its anatomy, make it look as if it is a tool user. And we thought the highest probability of a place for finding tools would be right there at the base of the chute. And the third thing we were testing in that chamber was whether we could find evidence of fire. Now that will probably be uh, done through the sampling of the soil and looking for microscopic or chemical traces that fire was in there because if Homo naledi entered the chamber, it's very likely that it was using a uh, fire. Although that would be very surprising for such a small brain species of ancient human relative. We're also though in another chamber, the Lissetti chamber. Uh, you might have heard in the news about three months ago, we announced we discovered a second chamber also with Homo naledi in it. And that had a skeleton in it that was very, very complete. We called Neo. And we thought we found an area where Neo's body might have slumped into. We were missing some critical parts that given the completeness of the skeleton, we shouldn't have been uh, missing. So we're conducting excavations down in that. So let me sort of set the stage of where we are, and then we'll go visit some of those um, uh, scientists and explorers that are underground right now in the Dinaletti and Lassay chamber. So I'm sitting in what is called the command center. Right next to me is scientist John Hawks. And Joe, if you could bring John up, he can uh, wave to the camera for a moment. John is a senior scientist on our team and part of the uh, communications 
team as well. He helps us with outreach, but he also conducts a lot of the scientific uh, research. He was the lead author on the NAO paper, the paper, the scientific paper describing NAO. And John's going to give you a little tour of the command center. Um, you can see from th this area, we have lots of screens, monitors, telephones that allow us to actually communicate with these various chambers that are very distant from us. There you can see the screens in front of us, and he's going to uh, zoom in on the sort of security cameras that we have. They're all viewing in infrared where we watch the action live uh, going on underground. Uh, if he raises the camera up, Steve Tucker, one of the discoverers, will wave to you. Steve is in the safety caver position. He sits waiting to handle any emergencies that might occur. Let's say uh, someone is injured or someone needs something in these caves. He races off to the cave to deliver or assist in, in coming out, out of there. So what I want to emphasize, this is a very dangerous environment. The humidity is very high. They're very deep underground. It's very, very difficult. And these are all highly trained and highly skilled people. Um, what I'm going to ask John to do for a moment, though, as he puts his camera um, back up onto his computer, is I want him to tell us a little bit about the anatomy of Homo naledi, and then we'll go and do something really special. We will go live into the chamber. Here's some of the first people in the world that actually get to enter the chamber, and you'll be able to interact with these underground astronauts, these uh, explorers who are actually making discoveries as you talk to them. So, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Lee. Um, Homo naledi is really a very interesting human relative. Um, we know that the species lived between 236 and 335,000 years ago here in the rising star cave system, but because Naledi is so different from us in many ways, we think that it's, as a species, must have originated much, much earlier. If you imagine what, what your body looks like as a human, Homo Naledi is different from you, from me, from everybody living now in lots of ways. It did stand upright like people today do, and its feet were very much like yours and mine, and its legs were long, and it seems to have been really well made for walking and, and doing so over long distances, potentially. So those are really human-like aspects of Naledi. But Naledi's brain was only about a third the size of a modern human's brain. It had a very small brain size, and its skull has very many primitive features. Those are features that are like species that lived up to two million years ago, species like Homo erectus and Homo habilis. So when we found those bones, we said, wow, this looks like a very primitive kind of species. It has other aspects that are a mixture of human-like and more primitive characteristics. Its hands, the wrist bones are configured very much like human hands today and its fingertips are very broad, and they look like they would have been very well made for using and making stone tools. But its fingers are very curved, and its shoulders are canted upwards like this in a way that looks like it was really good at reaching overhead. We think that those features combined tell us that Homo naledi was a really good climber. And we don't know if it was climbing in trees or in caves or on rocks, but it was definitely doing some different kinds of behaviors than humans do today. That mix of characteristics we have not seen in any other species. It's one of the things that makes Homo naledi so unique. So thanks for that overview, John. Um, now what we're gonna do is we're going to go join two scientists and explorers down in the Lissetti chamber. The Lissetti chamber is about 60 meters from me in a straight line, but you've gotta remember that John and I and Steve are sitting maybe eight to 10 meters underground already, and the Lissetti chamber is another 20 meters below us. So where you're about to go down in the Lissetti chamber is very deep underground, very difficult to get to, um, and in a very difficult to get to place. And I believe that I see Marina and Rick there. If you could bring them up, Joe. Hello, Marina and Rick. So Marina is uh, one of our lead explorers. She is a scientist that leads our exploration team. She was also the first scientist to enter the Dinaletti chamber. And Rick there is one of the people who actually discovered both the Dinaletti chamber and the Lissetti chamber. Hey, guys. Hey. So can you guys tell us a little bit first about 
what you're doing down in the Lissetti chamber, and also, have you made any discoveries? Your big test was, of course, can we find more bits of NAO? That's right. Thanks, Lee. Um, so the, the focus for the expedition for this part of the cave, the Lissetti chamber, was to actually try to find more of NAO's skeleton. And behind me here, you see a, a ladder that goes up into a very uh, tight tunnel. It's quite difficult to excavate in. But in that tunnel, there is a, a pile of, of dirt and sediments. And we think that maybe some of Nao's, um, the rest of Nao's body might be in among those sediments. We've been working for the past couple of weeks to try and see if we can find anything. And we haven't really found a tremendous amount uh, so far. But then today, I've just um, found a, a piece of bone. I don't even know what it is yet because I've only just started uh, excavating it out. But it is definitely bone and it looks like quite a big piece. So a um, few minutes or a couple of hours will tell what it might be and whether I can get it out safely. So um, it's right at the, the depth where we think would be a good place to look for, for Nao's remains. So I'm pretty hopeful that it is actually part of Nao's body. Oh, that's fantastic news. Uh, that's fantastic news um, about that. And if you want to actually uh, tune in on uh, at about uh, five o'clock this time, South African time, maybe Marina will have a little bit more news about what that bone is right here at Explorer's Classroom. Um, Rick, you were one of the first people into the Dinaletti Chamber. Can you tell us a little bit about what that journey was like? <laughs> That's one of the most brutal journeys you can possibly go through. But going to somewhere where you have never been and you know that no one else has ever set foot, you're going through areas that are so small that you nearly have to exhale. Areas where you look down and you just see blackness and the dark. And slowly working your way through and you end up in a chamber where you see it extends into further darkness. You push further and then you come across bones which could be the last person that made it down there. <laughs> That's about the best way I could describe it. That's fantastic. Uh, uh, guys, what they do is extremely dangerous. They're very well trained, but it also takes a great deal of bravery to journey into this. Just imagine yourself, you're 20 meters underground. You've just done a climb and you look down a little slot that is that wide, as wide as a 20 rand note, and down you go into it not knowing what's below you. That's the kind of bravery that these explorers have. We're going to jump over to the uh, Dinaletti chamber now. And I believe in the Dinaletti chamber, I am seeing, uh, is that Hannah and Matabella? Yeah, uh, hi, everyone. Hi, yes. Hi and there. also, I, probably that hand that leaned in from the background was Becca. And somewhere down below them, about three meters below them, is Ellen, you might hear a disembodied voice. How's it going down there, guys? It's going great. We're continuing to uncover um, what we think is a skull, and so we're really excited to keep, um, keep exposing this bone. So our big news is that since the last time we had an Explorer's Hangout, we knew we had some hominid fossils down below where Ellen is, and you'll, you'll get a view of that in just a moment. But the, we didn't know we would have good hominids up at the top of the chute, near the very top of it. And what has actually been discovered now is a crushed skull. It's a very badly crushed skull with teeth in it of a homo naledi. And underneath it looked like more and more bones are emer emerging. That is very exciting for us. These are some of the rarest sought after fossils on Earth. Matabella there, if you'd wave to the group there. Um, Matabella is a expert explorer on our team. Um, he's been with us uh, several years. Can you tell us, Matabella, sort of what it's like to excavate these fossils? Um, I have been exploring, not excavating, amazing I don't, I don't have words to explain it especially when it comes to this um this skull we've just found it's just amazing i don't know what else to say it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> amazing is a good word <laughs> uh, <that's a> very <laughs> good word <laughs> hannah maybe could you talk a little bit about the methods that are used for excavation uh, um i actually 
I'm right in the middle of excavation right now, so I have some of the tools that we use. We use very small brushes. Um, in some cases, we also use toothpicks or small wooden skewers, and those are nice because they're um, they're harder than the dirt, but they're often softer than the bone, so we won't damage the bone. Um, so we use a lot of a lot of unique. We we steal spoons from the kitchen to scoop out the dirt very very carefully from tiny places. So we have to improvise a lot. Um, Spoon here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <the spoon> here. <laughs> There's a little bit of time lag on our internet feed from there. Remember that it's quite amazing, uh, students, that we're actually getting feed from these underground environments where we've actually set up wireless internet. So they can also, you can tweet any of these explorers or any of these scientists or go on Facebook and follow them. They're often messaging uh, live from there. Becca, are you behind the camera there? I am, yes. Would, would you, Becca uh, is also one of the underground astronauts. She's actually playing camera person right now. Could you describe what it's like to work in the Dinaletti chamber? The Dinaletti chamber, where we're working right now, it's very steep. We're on, a, we're on a steep slope. Lee mentioned that Ellen is about three meters below us, but in a, in a horizontal line, she's still only about three meters away from us. So. It's, it's very steep right here and a little precarious. You can see that we uh, are seated on a ladder that's horizontal across an area that we're trying very hard not to step on. We're going uh, to actually uh, ask Joe to down. put that scene on. We're going to ask Joe to put that scene on so the students can see. You keep talking. Okay. So you can see that, that Hannah and Matabella are on a, uh, sitting on a ladder, and that ladder is spanning between two pieces of rock that are quite sturdy and it keeps us off the area that we're excavating so that we don't damage any of the fossils that are under that are would be underfoot if we were standing there down here is it's quite warm and it's very very humid all of our paper and and everything down here just feels damp at the end of the day a pretty exciting place to excavate every time you look up with your headlamp on you shine your light onto some really neat stalactites and other cave formations and office down here working. <laughs> that little, where, where John is now zooming in on, you can see Ellen excavating away in this little tiny area. Wave to the students, Ellen. They can see you from up here. <laughs> um, so I think it's a great time to maybe open this up to questions. This is a spectacular opportunity, students of Dane Fern to actually speak to uh, National Geographic explorers and scientists uh, that are actually in a cave underground making these historic discoveries that you'll read about in newspapers in several years from now. But you can kind of say you were there when that was discovered. So if, if maybe we can open up to questions, Joe, and you take over for a bit, we'll try and answer questions from this side. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lee and team, for a nice glimpse down into the chambers and filling us in on what it's like to be uh, there and making these amazing discoveries. So as you mentioned, we do have a group joining us from Dane Fern College in Johannesburg. And I believe it's a group of about 100 grade six students. Let's see how everyone's doing today. How's everybody? Your microphone's on. Can you hear us now? I can hear you. Okay. All this right, I have a feeling there's some questions here. Good afternoon. My name is Paris, and my question for you is how can we be sure that the skeleton remains in the Lissetti chamber belong to Homo naledi and not some other species? That's a really fantastic question. Um, what we do as scientists is that we use what's called comparative anatomy. Basically, we take all the bones, the remains, the remains of the head, the remains of the teeth, the remains of the body, and with Homo naledi, we're very lucky because we have almost every bone in the body represent multiple times, and we compare it to every single fossil of an ancient human relative, and even modern humans, and relatives like chimpanzees and gorillas to make sure that they're not the same. We look at both individual bones, individual areas of anatomy, as well as uh, individual uh, the whole package together. Um, one of the neat, and, and in that, we can clearly say that first, Homo naledi is a 
separate species. But what's very interesting about Homo naledi is many areas of its anatomy are utterly unique to it. So if we find even a tiny piece, an example of that is a thumb. If we find even a tiny piece of the thumb, we know immediately that we're dealing with Homo naledi and not other species. Some areas of anatomy we need more. John, do you want to jump in as an answer to that as well? Sure. When we look at Nao's skeleton, for instance, you know, incredible evidence from much of the skeleton. He doesn't have every part of the skeleton represented that we've found in the Dinaletti chamber, but the parts that we have, the anatomy that Nao has, is very much the same as the Dinaletti chamber, Homo naledi examples. So when we look at his teeth, for example, his teeth have the same size proportions and the morphological features that make Naledi's teeth very primitive are also found in Nao's teeth. The teeth are very much the same. Likewise, his femora, the thigh bones, have features that we've seen on the Naledi thigh bones from the Dinaledi chamber. They have a long neck, they have a relatively small head, and their neck is sort of flattened from front to back. That's a feature that we don't see in humans or other members of our genus, but we do see in Homo naledi, and Nao is very much the same. It's by going down the skeleton and comparing Nao and the Dinaledi hominins and every other species that we find those special characteristics that, that set Naledi apart, and the Nao skeleton has all of those features. Both Ellen and Marina are, were part of the teams that described the anatomy Ellen or Marina, uh, if you can hear me, do you have anything to add to what we were saying? Um, yeah, Leah, I was just going to mention um, this question was sort of why, how, how do we know that, that Nao, the, basically the one sort of most complete skull that we found in Lissetti, also belongs to, to Homo naledi? And that is exactly what you guys have been describing, is not only do we compare them to other species, but to each other. So um, fortunately for us, we have enough of Nao it to what we've got individuals in the Dinaledi chamber and every single part is is very close so um, it's it's really nice it's another opportunity to to look at a whole individual and Nao's really cool because in the Dinaledi chamber all those 50, 15 individuals are kind of mixed together so we don't have a really good sense of what just one individual looks like because he's he's sort of on his own we have a really nice opportunity to his body and compare it now the Dinaledi material to him and get a sense of what one individual uh, Homo naledi would look like. Fantastic. Thank you, Marina. Okay, Joe, I think we can take another question. All right, Paris, thank you so much for that question. Uh, Mike's back John, on. We're just moving outside to try to avoid the feedback. This is Robbie. Hello, I'm Robbie, and my question for you is how did the Homo naledi hominid possibly communicate? A great question. How did Homo naledi possibly communicate, Robbie? And the answer is we have no idea. Uh, the we've we found so far really just Homo naledi in these chambers, and we don't know much about the world that they existed. We can tell from their anatomy, though, quite a few things, and we're very fortunate because John Hawk sitting next to me happens to be uh, one of the experts on working on the neuroanatomy, our brain anatomy. Uh, that tells us quite a lot. But before he, he does talk about that, I'll mention that uh, Homo naledi's jaws and teeth are very small, and some people have argued that those are signals of the ability to have language. Also, if our hypothesis that Homo naledi was deliberately disposing of their dead in these chambers is true, it's likely they had some sophisticated levels of communication. You want to take over from that, John? Sure. When we look at the way that humans talk, we use our throats and our mouths, and, and we listen with our ears. And each of those parts has changes that, that make humans really well suited to language that other kinds of primates don't have. With Homo naledi, we don't yet have the key bone in the throat, the hyoid bone, that could tell us about its shape. So we don't have that answer yet. We do have some of the bones of the middle ear, that, that do evolve in humans to respond to hearing. We're studying those now, and we don't know what the answer is going to look like, but we're going to find out what Homo naledi could have heard. But the most important organ that supports talking in humans is actually the brain, because we have to be able to understand and decipher language and to produce language. 
Homo naledi's brain was very small compared to ours, about a third the size of human brains. But in the part of the brain that humans use for language, that's on the left side, just behind the forehead, Homo naledi's brain was shaped very much like a human brain and different from the brains of very primitive hominins like Australopithecus africanus. So we do think that there may have been some changes to Naledi's brain that may have had to do with communication. We're going to keep working on these bones to try to find out if they can hear language like we do and if they could speak like we do. Thank you for that, John. And I think we can grab another question, Joe, if there's time. All right, Robbie, thanks so much for the question. Let me turn our mic back on and it looks like someone's ready to go. Hello, my name's Erin and my question for you is, do you have any regrets regarding your career as a paleoanthropologist? <laughs> do I have, Erin, thank you for that. Do I have any regrets as a paleoanthropologist? I regret I didn't start earlier. I love what I do. I'm having the time of my life. Uh, it hasn't been an easy road because this is a field of discovery where you often go a very long time without making discoveries. And these are some of the rarest sought after objects on earth. Um, and so I actually went 17 years of looking before my first major discovery, which was actually made by my then nine year old son, Matthew, you might have heard the story of Australopithecus sediba that he was involved in. But uh, it is a, so, so if anything, I wish I'd got involved with this much younger and been exploring uh, four fossils and things like this at a much younger age. But you know what I'm going to put? I'm going to put Hannah on the spot. Hannah, do you have any regrets in your career? <laughs> um. Well, as a paleoanthropologist, I don't know that I am a paleoanthropologist. Can you, can you hear us in the gentle lady chamber? I can hear you there. Oh, uh, we seem to have lost their microphone. Um, really and the study chamber, can you hear us? We can hear you, and we can hear Dinaletti. Yeah, Lee, I can hear Dinaletti, okay. Okay, all right, go ahead. Go ahead, Hannah. <laughs> Um, in terms of my, my career as uh, an archaeologist, I don't think I have any regrets. I'm also having the time of my life. This is one of the most fun things that I've ever been a part of. So, Fantastic. Uh, Marina, you want to add to that? Yeah, it's a, a tough question for sure. Um, yeah, no regrets so far. Um, you know, I, I took a, a circuitous route to, to paleoanthropology. I did a bunch of other things beforehand, um, but I don't regret any of them because all of those skills actually got me to where I am now. So I used to be a, a climber and a caver and, and a hiker and all kinds of things, but all of those skills actually uh, helped me along the way. So yeah, so far it's, uh, it's been brilliant. That's great to hear. All right, Joe, I think we can take another one. All right, looks like we have someone ready to go. Let me turn their mic on. Awesome. Hi, I'm Adrian, and my question is, how big is the largest common lady fossil we have excavated? Wow. So he's asking uh, how big the fossil is. Yeah, how big is the largest Homo naledi uh, fossil that we found? That's kind of hard to say because sometimes they're broken apart, but when we put them together, uh, they become very, very complete. Uh, we can answer easily from the head. That would be Nao's skull. If you go online and top, uh, type in uh, Nao and Naledi, you'll see this uh, beautiful skull that, that was recovered. That's one of the most complete specimens. That's, of course, attached to a very complete skeleton. John, what is the most complete uh, postcranial bone we have? Well, I'll tell you that we do have a very complete tibia. That's a shin bone that is almost the whole thing and is, is one of the longest things we've got. We've also got a very complete humerus, the upper arm bone. But the biggest Naledi individual, we think is probably went along with that tibia. That tibia comes from a, a relatively big individual, probably a male individual. And they would have stood about 1.4 meters tall, so about 140 centimeters tall. And they would have weighed around the larger individuals around 40 kilograms or 45 kilograms. So you can imagine that Naledi is about the size of some of you, uh, some of you sixth graders out there. 
um, very typical and, and might might actually be lurking around in the crowd right now. <laughs> Joe, back to you. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's check in for one more question from our, our group in Johannesburg. Let me turn your mic on. There we go. Hi, my name is Olivia, and my question is, what characteristics <clears throat> make up a good paleoanthropologist? Oh, great question. Um, let's go down to Marina to answer, what questions make up a great paleoanthropologist? What questions or what qualities? Uh, what quality? Quite Sorry. Quite. Um, well, you know what? I think probably the biggest thing that that makes a good scientist of any kind is curiosity. So if you're curious about something and you you want to find out about the world and whatever that is, I mean, we we study humans and and how we got to be the way we are, and that's certainly an interesting question, but. For anyone um, who wants to go into the sciences, I think curiosity is a really important quality. And then um, I think just the ability to work hard for sure uh, helps. Um, in this particular field, it, it helps to be a, a bit crazy maybe, um, just because it's this is not your, your average lab. But um, yeah, certainly curiosity and, and just the, the willingness to work hard and, and um, long hours. Those are sort of qualities that are, are pretty important in our field. I'm going to add one more thing. One of the great things I think, I hope you sense from all of these scientists and explorers is the ability to have fun and love what you do. We're all having the time of our lives. We're very privileged to be involved with this expedition, finding these just wonderful fossils. It's also a privilege to communicate with school groups like yours and those that are hanging in and work with organizations like National Geographic. Joe? All right. Well, Lee and team, thank you so much for another amazing hangout from uh, the Rising Star Cave System. Um, we'll let you guys in a moment get back to some, some solid science, and we look forward to connecting again in about four hours. So we have another hangout scheduled for 11 a.m. Eastern with a group of classrooms from North America, and I believe that'll be about 5 o'clock uh, South African time. So any students who are at home uh, can jump onto YouTube, and uh, you can watch live um the next hangout and actually it looks like maybe we'll get a bonus question so it looks like someone's ready to go and maybe we'll sign off after this final All question right. i want to leave them out there in the hall so here we go i would like to say thank you very much for this virtual tour and we learned so much from this wonderful opportunity and we wish you many more great discoveries well thank you very much and i'm sure each of the 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 teams will say thank you from the chambers thank you for listening and thank you for being a great audience and wonderful questions all right and it's always fun to sign off with a big goodbye and thank you from the group joining us so let's hear how loud we can be in johannesburg so nice and loud guys <laughs> All right, so once again, thank you to Lee, John, Marina, Monabella, uh, Rick, Hannah, Becca, Ellen, and Steve. It's been amazing, and I look forward to seeing everybody in a few hours. Bye.